meeting is now being recorded. Welcome, everybody. In today's webinar, we'll hear from UMS, the University Musical Society, who, with the support of the Wallace Foundation, is working to develop adventurous audiences with its Renegade events. Renegade features innovative, risk-taking music, dance, and theater, often in alternative and unexpected places. As part of Renegade, UMS has presented a number of dance makers from around the world. Dance USA is a communications partner with the Wallace Foundation on Wallace's Building Audiences for Sustainability initiative. We're sharing news about the initiative and the learnings on building audiences for the arts with the field in um, webinars such as this. Many resources such as case studies, practical guides, and reports on audience building are available for download from the Wallace Foundation's website. Just look for the Knowledge Center and you'll see there's a URL here where you can find that. Now, today's speakers are Sarah Billman, who is the Marketing and Communications Director for the University Musical Society, which is a 140-year-old multidisciplinary presenting organization at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Sarah oversees strategic and creative campaigns for a 50-event season in classical music, theater, dance, jazz, and world music. Jim Leha is the Director of Education and Community Engagement for the University Musical Society, and he provides the strategic direction for UMS's community, university, and K-12 youth engagement and education programs, and also leads the team that produces over 125 free or low-cost education events and a range of educational materials each season. Thank you both for being here today. Thanks very much, and uh, welcome everybody to the call. This is Jim. Um, we're, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to give us a, a presentation in about 10 to 15 minutes on uh, our Renegade programs and also um, the ways in which the, the Wallace Project has intersected with, uh, intersected with Renegade. And then Sarah and I are going to be in conversation for a little bit, which would give you some time to think about your questions for the Q&A period, and we would just invite you, as we're going, to enter those Q&A questions right into the public chat whenever they, whenever they surface for you. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Joanna. Uh, a bit about UMS, Joanna covered some of it, but we have been around since 1879 and present a number of performances each year across multiple disciplines. Those performances are presented in seven to ten different spaces each year because we don't own our own venue. And four to five of those spaces each year tend to be pretty much the same, a 3,600-seat concert hall, a 1,400-seat venue for dance and theater, a 10,000, 10, 10, 10, a uh, 160-seat venue for chamber music, and other venues here on the University of Michigan campus. Our annual budget is about $9 million, and we were very honored four years ago to receive the 2014 National Medal of the Arts from President Obama. We were the first university presenter to receive that honor. A little bit about our audiences. As you might imagine, since we're based on a university campus, we have quite a large student audience. Uh, roughly 21, 22 percent of our paid audience is uh, university students each year. And our average age has been pretty consistent for the last decade or so in the upper 40s to early 50s. Like many arts organizations, we have a lot of graduate and professional degree um, members in our audience and a huge number who have graduated college. And for us, we're located about an hour from Metro Detroit. Um, but two-thirds of our um, audience members typically come from Washtenaw County and another roughly 20% from the Metro Detroit area. So I'm starting with this RAND framework for building participation in the arts, which was a project that Wallace Foundation actually worked on close to 20 years ago. And as we think about how we develop audiences, we often turn to this RAND study which looked at different ways of how to do that. And, and one of their key ways of doing that was to go broader and get more people in the door. And the other was to go deeper and to really enhance the experience for those who are already attending. And I think what you'll find with our Renegade project is that we're actually trying to uh, do both of those things at the same time. The focus for our project was a thread of programming that we did in the 2011-12 season. And that was intended initially as a programmatic thread that was supposed to be just for that one season, but it kind of grew on to take, a life, take on a life of its own and has now become a mainstay of our programming for the last six or seven years. 
Now, one thing to know about Wallace Foundation grants is that they're iterative and they're really testing grounds for checking assumptions and adjusting plans along the way. So as Johanna mentioned in her introduction, Renegade for us are events that focus on innovative, game-changing artistic work. And when we first launched the series back in 2011, <clears throat> Renegade actually encompassed a much broader meaning. It was looking at artists who were game changers, artists and composers who were game changers in their time. So we actually had a program in our first season of the Talis Scholars performing Jez Waldo from the Renaissance because his work was very different than what had come before it and a concert of Beethoven string quartet. Over the course of some of the research that I'll talk about later, we found that that um, concept was difficult for audiences to grasp onto. And over the last couple of years, we've focused the programmatic uh, thread of this work to be much more in the contemporary realm. Um, the other thing that is interesting about Wallace Foundation grants is that they come with a sizable research budget which is really a great gift for all of us to dig into our assumptions about audiences through both qualitative and quantitative research. And as we did that starting in the 2015-16 season, one of the things that we really learned as we focused on renegade audiences was that the target audience was really a, a people who are willing to embrace adventurousness. Um, over those two years, uh, the first two years of the grant, 2015, 16, and 16, 17, we learned a lot about our audiences from this research. And I'll talk in, in greater detail about the research in a moment. One of the things that we learned was that instead of focusing the target audience on um, particular genres or particular um, mindsets, we really focused it on people who are adventurous. And that might be people who are adventurous broadly, who might go to classical music, who might go to dance, who might go to theater. But that was a big shift for us in how we thought about the audiences that we were targeting for this grant. As I mentioned earlier, we also reframed the programmatic concept so that it would align, align more clearly with what the audiences thought of when they heard the word renegade without uh, adjusting our own core programmatic principles and values. We refined our branding um, one of the challenges that we found was that our renegade events looked exactly like every other event on the season. And so especially in those early years where we had a more broad-based uh, definition of what renegade meant, there was nothing for the audience member to hang on to to realize that this was different. So for us, the branding created more of a visual identity that supported the curatorial concept and felt less like just a marketing tool that we were using. We also looked at different venues. Uh, some of those were places that are unusual and off the beaten track. Some of those are places that had never been used for a performing arts venue before, and that added to the mystique of what was happening on the stage. And then finally, as I talked earlier about broadening the audiences, we started to build a prospect pool that was really focused on adventurousness. And we did that by um, developing blog partnerships where we would be talking about adventurous events throughout Southeast Michigan, not just our own, and ideally getting some of those partners that we were writing about to share that content with their own uh, mailing list and distribution channels. We started live streaming some of our events as a way of getting people who might be a little bit nervous or unable to drive to Ann Arbor to check out what we were doing and become more comfortable with who we are before they made the plunge and bought their own ticket. We also did a couple of um, sort of secret or pop-up concerts uh, just to see what would happen if we, for instance, announced the concert but didn't tell people who was performing or where it was going to be. And that was quite an interesting experiment that we'll talk about later as well. And then the, the last thing that I would say that we learned as part of the prospect pool was to really dig into and do data mining on our own database so that we could explore uh, people's ticket history through a different lens. So some examples of what we learned, putting this, uh, these words into more concrete uh, steps. From a, from a branding standpoint, we changed how we represented Renegade events in our print materials. We had a visual indication of this yellow stripe that crossed all of those performances. Um, and that was different from what other events in the season looked like. So, for instance, a couple of years ago, we presented Complicite's The Encounter, 
which was a, a really unique theater performance where audience members listened to the entire thing through headphones, and it literally took place in their heads. And you can see that that had that broad yellow stripe across the web page, and this was used in all of our print materials as well. Compared to a non-Renegade event, Handel's Messiah, <laughs> which has a very different look and feel on our website and in all of our materials. I alluded earlier to some of the venues that we presented in, and perhaps the most unusual space that we went in was the Detroit Boxing Gym, where we presented Nora Chipamire's Portrait of Myself as My Father. Um, these were some, this was a piece that was originally written to be performed in a boxing gym, but we were actually the first place that found a boxing gym to do the performances. And audience members from Detroit and Ann Arbor <clears throat> all traveled to this unique uh, gym that's really used for school children after school and had quite a different experience than what they normally encounter in a proscenium venue. We opened one season with a jazz event at a skate park here in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And that combined a jazz combo with professional skateboard artists playing off of the art of improvisation. This was a free event. Thank goodness it turned out to be a beautiful, sunny Sunday afternoon. Another event that we did in an unusual venue was about six months ago when we presented a theater piece called Bubble Schmeisses at the Schwitz in Detroit. And the Schwitz is the oldest um, still working bathhouse in Detroit and was the perfect setting for this uh, presentation about um, a young boy um, bonding with his uncle, grandfather, I'm trying to remember. Grandfather. <laughs> grandfather, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, we also changed how we looked at the audience experience. And this is really, to a certain degree, an extension of the branding, because we wanted people, when they came into the venue, to understand that this was something different. And so for a piece by Igor Moreno, which was a dance show that was largely based on two dancers bouncing up and down on stage for about an hour. We put bouncy balls in the lobby for audience members to have the same experience. And it was amazing how it brought audiences together in a completely different way, total strangers talking to each other as they sat on these inflatable balls and unicorns. <laughs> For Taylor Mass, we had a very different lobby experience in a traditional space where as soon as people came in, they could tell that they were getting a different experience. And for Netherlands Dance Theater last March, we uh, partnered with a virtual reality artist and brought in a VR globe that was in the lobby um, concurrently with the Ann Arbor Film Festival happening down the street so that people could experience a virtual reality dance piece in a completely different way. I mentioned earlier that we've done some live streaming to build new audiences. That started with Igor and Moreno. It also included Steve Reich, who's Music for 18 Musicians. We've worked with the university's multimedia team to film these, usually multi-camera shoots, and we've been doing about five to six of them a year. And lastly, just uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we presented a secret show. Um, you may think that perhaps we purposely didn't tell people the artist when you see the bassoon soloist there, but that, in fact, was not the case. It was really just meant to get people to experience something that they didn't know what they were getting in a different and surprising way. From the audience research and data analysis piece, and believe me, I will not read through all of these slides because it's way too much information, but in 2015-16 was when we really kicked this off, and we did so with both uh, qualitative and quantitative research, starting with in-depth interviews and focus groups and using that information to develop an online survey. This information really helped us to identify who the target audience for Renegade events might be. And then the following year, we took that information and applied it in a more rigorous way to our database so that we put together a scoring rubric to try to understand and identify which audience members might be more interested in this type of work. So to put a finer point on it, this is what we discovered. And I know that's just crystal clear with lots of different shapes and colors all feeding into each other. But the long and short of this slide is just showing that there are actually many pathways to adventurousness and, and figuring out which ones are the best predictors of these different pathways really um, ultimately focused on people who are explicitly risk-seeking and willing to try something new. I should add at this point that not all adventurous programs on our season have the tag of renegade, 
And not all renegade events have always been adventurous. Again, that has shifted in the last few years, but, um, but it's an important distinction because it allows us to look at our season holistically and not just what falls into a particular series that we're presenting. In year two, as we looked at how we could take what we learned in year one and apply it more specifically and rigorously to our work, we developed what we called the ABI, the Adventurousness Behavioral Index. And this was done in two different ways. We developed a scoring rubric for artists, and then we applied scores to our database to figure out what people's adventurousness score was. And then in the third year, we took that a step further and actually um, deployed a survey, a two-minute survey, to audience members that explored their attitudes about adventurousness. Did they see themselves and perceive, it, perceive themselves as risk takers? We did focus groups after that survey was deployed where there was a discrepancy, where people who attended adventurous work but said that they were pretty conservative in their tastes um, had one group, and then we had another group of the opposite. And ultimately what we really learned was that the behavioral scoring that we did was a pretty good proxy and that we didn't need to worry about continually updating our database with attitudinal surveys. We found that about 80% of the people who filled out the attitudinal survey, uh, their results in that particular survey mimicked what we saw in their uh, behavioral patterns. So this adventurous behavioral indicator is a little bit complicated at first, but it's actually a really nifty tool that we've been able to use in a number of different ways. So the first thing we did two years ago was to take six years of every artist who has been on our season, and we scored them across nine different rubrics. Those questions or those rubrics were how unknown is the artist? Are they considered a pioneer? Is the program cross-disciplinary or multimedia? Is it new work? Is it challenging or intellectually demanding? What is the venue like? Is it traditional or unconventional? Um, what about the format? Is it something that starts at 11 in the morning or at 11 at night rather than the traditional 7.30 or 8 p.m.? And to what extent is the program contemporary or abstract? When we applied each of these nine questions to every artist on the season for those six years, we used a pretty um, rigid scoring rubric of 0, 1, 4, and 10, because we knew that Jim 7 might be the same as my 5 for some events or vice versa. And so we wanted to have something that was really just a low, medium, and high. So if you look at the top 20 artists across those seasons, you can see that the event that had the highest score was Tanya Tagak in concert with Nanook of the North, which had a 67. Highly unlikely that any artist would ever get into that 90 range. Following that was Nora Chipamiri, the boxing gym show that we talked about, and a few others that you may recognize near the top. If we look at the examples of artists with the lowest scores, probably not surprisingly that Handel's Messiah is at the bottom of that list. It's a core piece of performance that is on the radio constantly. We present it every year and have since 1879 when we were founded. And this generally follows for our organization, which has a very strong basis in classical music, the lower scores and the least risk was for those kinds of classical music events. Um, typically speaking, uh, the highly adventurous patrons accounted for roughly 19 or 20 percent of our um, database each year, and that was very consistent from year to year, although people did move along in different categories from year to year. And so if we think about it as an adventurous continuum, we have the people who we call the adventurous averse. They really just want comfort music. They want to be entertained. They don't necessarily want a highly intellectual exercise. And that tended to be just over half of our database. The adventure curious were the people who probably skewed towards safer events, but they were curious and willing to try new work. And they were about a quarter of our database. And the adventurous souls were the people who were really curious, willing to try new work. They were risk takers, but we learned in the focus groups that they were also very price sensitive. And so how that plays out in our database, we, have a, we use Tessitura and we have a plugin called the um, segmentation engine that made it very, very easy for us to track this. And without going into too much detail, you can see that for the course of our entire um, season, I think this was two seasons worth, our average rep score for a, a patron in our database was 13. 
but the minimum was zero, which would have been people who only attended Handel's Messiah, and the maximum was 67, which was that Tanya Tagak performance mentioned earlier. And if you look at it in terms of how it lays out on a bar graph, you can see that there's a lot of movement in the lower scores, um, and then it kind of peters out as we get more and more adventurous. So these were the people that we were particularly interested in cultivating for the Renegade events, those who had scores of 20, 22 plus. And of course, there were far fewer of them. So then the question, of course, becomes, did this actually work or was this just an exercise to play around with data because we had research money? And I'm delighted to report that, in fact, it did work. And we had uh, two great examples last year of how we applied this. In January, we did a four-week theater festival called No Safety, no Safety Net. And in this festival, we had four different theater pieces that were really grappling with issues of social justice um, and engagement. And so equal weight was given to the moments off the stage where there was community dialogue, but the, the plays themselves really presented difficult issues. Um, and it was quite, quite a fascinating festival. Three months earlier, we had done a residency with the New York Philharmonic celebrating uh, Leonard Bernstein's centenary. And that had pretty standard rep, uh, very accessible, a lot of uh, price points to make it accessible to large numbers of people. Before, well, the, the average artist score for the four no safety net performances was 54.8. So you can see that that was towards the top end of the scale if we looked at that range from earlier uh, where we had ranked all of the artists. Compare that with the New York Philharmonic, where the average score was 4.7, very much an easy entry point, low risk kind of event. Interestingly, for these two events, the new to file accounts for no safety net was 41% of the total people who attended, whereas with New York Phil, it was 29%. So then what I did was for anybody who wasn't new to file, but who had attended UMS performances in the previous um, two years, I looked at their average rep score over those two years. And in fact, the adventurous score for the no safety net people was 24 compared to 9.4 for the New York Phil, which shows me that we're on to something with the adventurousness scores and that it really is an indicator, regardless of genre, of what people are interested and willing to experience. So Sarah, can I ask a question really quickly to clarify that? When you say, um, in terms of how you configured this, new to file were people that were not in the ticketing database before Correct. the series, and you took the new people out actually That's right. and looked at the at other people's uh, people who had ticket history already. That's correct. Got it. Thank you. That's correct. Because otherwise, the new to file would have artificially inflated Plated. the adventurousness scores. So a few takeaways as we wrap up here, and I'm sorry this has gone a little over the 15 minutes. Um, one, and, and we didn't talk about this much, but one thing that's really important to note is that the young do not have a lock on adventurousness. When we look at our renegade audience compared to our other audiences, they tend to follow the same trends in terms of age and other demographics. And everybody assumes that the young people are the risk-taking people, but in fact, sometimes we find the opposite that it's the people who have been coming to performances for years and years and years who are looking to be shaken up a little bit and looking for something new. Another trick, which I think is actually an important takeaway for organizations of every size, is that experimenting is really key. You have to be willing to do A-B testing, to put out a new offer, and ultimately to test your own assumptions instead of just listening to the data point of one that's telling you that something is right. Owning your own space. In our case, as I mentioned earlier, we don't own our own venues, so we had to figure out what we could do to really own the space, the lobbies, and make it seem so that when somebody was walking into the Power Center for a UMS show, it was a very different experience than when they walked into the Power Center for another organization's performance. As you might imagine, for adventurous shows, social media and online strategies are critically important to our success. And certainly one of the things we learned from the research was that adventurous people are much more interested in engaging with technology. And finally, and this is again something that I think can apply to organizations of all sizes, qualitative research can yield great information. You just have to be willing to talk to people. It doesn't need to be in a professional focus group facility, although it's kind of fun when it is. Um, but, but really just being able to ask people questions and get them talking to each other and talking to you 
about what they are enjoying and really probing to get that information. As uh, my colleague Alan Brown from Wolf Brown, who has conducted all of our research, says, people will do almost anything for a cookie. And if you invite them to sit down after the performance and talk, they're happy to do so. So with that, I just uh, would like to thank you for listening so patiently to a, a long presentation about what we've been doing at the University Musical Society to bring adventurous audiences into the fold. And uh, from there, I will turn it back to Jim Thank or you. to put me on the on the stand. To, to grill you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and just as a reminder, please use the public chat to pose your own questions, and you can do so at any time. Um, so I want to backtrack a little bit and um, go back to the scoring exercise. Yeah. And I'm really curious to um, hear about who does the scoring and um, also just what you sort of learned from the exercise of going through the scoring uh, over a couple of different seasons now? That's a, those are both great questions. So in our case, the, when we first uh, launched the scoring <clears throat> exercise, we primarily used representatives from UMS staff, um, but we also reached out to a couple of people outside of the organization, uh, some at the School of Music, a couple of students, because we wanted to see how much our internal bias might play into what was happening. Um, and in fact, we found that by and large, um, if anything, we might be a little bit more conservative about the adventure scores than, uh, than other um, people external to the organization. Um, we also discovered that it makes a huge difference when we score at the beginning of the season so that there isn't revisionist history. Um, <laughs> so really, we should be doing this exercise every year in August or September. And um, the third thing I should say about it is that when people were doing the scoring, and this is really hard for people within the organization, it's meant to be looking at the marketing materials and at the website, not at having previously attended a performance or whatever knowledge we bring to the table about that particular group. Because we're trying to approach it the way that an audience member who is trying to decide whether to come or not would approach it, and that would be what are they looking at on the website, mm -hmm. what are they looking at in the brochure, and how is that influencing their decision making? Yeah, and so we in certain ways act as kind of an avatar for an audience member by just using the information that an audience member would have to make their own right. decision. And of course we've had some staff turnover in that time, so a couple of people who did some of the scoring have moved on and new people have come in who come at it with very different backgrounds. So last year we implemented the um, Russian judge approach for the ice skating at the Olympics. And we threw out the low score and the high score and averaged the others together to be able to come up with the right number for people. I didn't realize that you were doing that. I was doing that. <laughs> we had a few outliers last year. <laughs> um, and would you talk a little bit about just sort of where some of the, the frictions surface when you're doing this process and what you, and like in terms of how we kind of construct the notion of adventurousness? Frictions on adventurousness or frictions on scoring? Well, I should say, do we have uh, unanimous agreement on what constitutes adventurousness in this rubric? Um, we do not have, have unanimous agreement, and frankly, that's part of the reason why we throw out the high and low scores, because um, people who are doing these, the scoring often attend a lot more, so I think mm -hmm. the bar is a little bit higher. Um, and it's very hard to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's a novice and who um, may be looking at something, trying to decide if they're going to come for the first time. Yeah. We've also had any number of conversations from the programmatic side about what constitutes renegade and what constitutes adventurousness on the programming side. You know, if there's a four-minute piece by Albon Berg on a symphonic program that also includes a major symphonic work that is 150 years old, does that mean that people are coming and that we can count it as renegade? And, and we've gone to the mat a few times on some of those conversations. Well, there's always this question about thinking about uh, sort of risk for someone who's never, who doesn't have a relationship with classical music coming to classical music. And I think there could be some parallel there for actually like in the dance world that I for do. some people, attending a, a ballet is going to feel a lot riskier than going to see you know, something focused on hip-hop or contemporary dance. This is why I'm such an advocate of qualitative research, because about 10 years ago, we did one-on-one -on -one interviews with audience members, and we asked people, what was the riskiest event you've ever attended? 
And one audience member responded, oh, no question, it was the Takash String Quartet because I'd never been to a string quartet before, and that was really scary for me. And for us as an organization that has spent 140 years focused on classical music, that was exactly what we needed to hear to kind of shake us out of our own complacency, mm -hmm. because we were just assuming that everybody understood that, that side of our programming. So as you are thinking through this research, um, certainly dance programming is included as part of mm -hmm. Renegade series and also in terms of the adventurousness continuum, you've, you've had a lot of experience um, in marketing and presenting dance here at UMS. And I wonder, as you kind of work through um, the implications of the research, what do you think uh, some of the implications might be for dance specifically? Well, I think, you know, what, what strikes me is so interesting about the research and certainly one of the things that we have found that identifies people who are willing to be adventurous is their willingness to embrace abstraction. Mm -hmm. And I think for new audience members coming into dance in particular, that is often the thing that scares them the most, is that if something is abstract, will they get it? What's the story? What's the plot? Mm -hmm. What if there isn't one? What's my pathway in? So for me, as I think about how we market dance, it's really trying to get people a lot more comfortable with the notion that it doesn't have to be about something. It can actually just be about the beauty of movement on the stage and what that looks like. Um, and, and that's kind of how I'm trying to shift my own thinking. Of course, it's always nice to have something easy for people to grab onto, but we're mm -hmm. also trying to get people a lot more comfortable with trusting their own judgment and being willing just to try something new to them. So it's interesting cause, because one of the dimensions of of uh, the scoring rubric is abstraction. Absolutely. Partially. And then, I mean, looking back, you know, in that rubric, um, and I want to kind of just frame this because I do think it's important, as people might imagine what they can take away from this research and apply to their own work, is that we're looking at dimensions of adventurousness that are partly aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, partly about um, intellectual mm -hmm. riskiness, um, difficult topics, um, partly about contextual adventure. So whether that's like, it has to do with like setting something in a place that people aren't necessarily used to going to. And then also there's like a social component as well. So these are all things mm -hmm. that um, I think wrap around those nine, maybe those are the categories mm -hmm. that kind of encapsulate those nine dimensions of adventurousness that we look at. Um, in terms of thinking now, now you've done this research, we know kind of within the context of our own patron base, you know, who is more adventurous. Um, how has that changed marketing behavior so far? Well, I think where it's, it, where it's changed it, it's been somewhat visible and somewhat un invisible. Mm -hmm. The visible side of it is that we are trying in our copywriting to be more overt about things being adventurous and about things being risky and about mm -hmm. taking a risk and feeling comfortable with that. Um, our, our tagline for Renegade is something like where curious audiences meet unexpected ideas. And so we're really trying to embrace this notion of getting comfortable with the unexpected. Um, on the invisible side, when I'm creating mailing lists now, if I'm creating a mailing list for a dance performance, I'm not only looking at past dance performances. Mm -hmm. I'm also looking at um, we just did uh, Hubbard Street Dance Chicago with um, <clears throat> Third Coast Percussion. Mm -hmm. And so for that, it wasn't just about the dance, but it was also looking at the people who came to Steve Reich's Music for 18 Musicians, who are clearly willing to embrace a different kind of music than what they might be used to hearing from um, Hubbard Street when they've come here before, and it's been to a largely uh, more familiar classical school. Yeah. Um, so, so we're looking at the adventure scores that way and saying, well, if, if Hubbard Street comes in at this particular score, what are other people who have been around that area? And when I'm pulling together the mailing list, it's not necessarily just pulling dance attendees from the past, but it's also looking at people who have comparable scores for their events for other events that they've gone to. So in a sense, there's just a, an approach here that's kind of moved beyond genre affinity. Right. And if I'm like, if I were to extrapolate that out and just think about some ways that people, you know, if you're not a multidisciplinary presenter, you're presenting only dance, only music or so on, 
um, that we might actually uh, use this information to think about where there are affinities maybe with other kinds of arts organizations mm -hmm. or ensembles. That, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That, and, and, that, and that might be an approach to thinking about how to build audiences beyond mm -hmm. what you sort Absolutely. of have living in your own database already. That's right. Um, you had said, uh, you had, in one of your slides, you had something about uh, the difference between a curatorial concept mm -hmm. and a marketing concept. And I imagine we all sort of navigate the space between kind of an artistic idea mm -hmm. and like having to communicate that idea through marketing. And I wonder if you could just talk more about those concepts and what they mean to you. Yeah, um, that was actually one of the hardest things to swallow in the early stages of the research was when we brought together focus groups of people who had attended Renegade events, um, one of the comments that they made was at the time, again, this is several years ago, <clears throat> that Renegade felt like a marketing tag. And mm. that there didn't, they didn't perceive there to be a thread that tied those events together. And in, in the very first season that we presented Renegade, we had, um, it was a 10 week period where we had Einstein on the beach, the Homburg Symphony doing a, a Messian uh, symphony um, with a film uh, that went along with it. Um, the San Francisco Mavericks, San Francisco Symphony Mavericks Festival, which was four concerts performed here that was all contemporary 20th century music. But then we also had the Talis Scholars concert that I mentioned earlier and the Hagen Spring Quartet and a dance company, Random Dance, um, Wayne McGregor's group, and Robert Lepage. I think that was all of them, if I remember right. I think right. you're right. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's amazing how that steered in my brain. Um, so, so we were using this, this phrase, renegade, and people were saying, well, I don't get what the Hagen String Quartet playing Beethoven has to do with the San Francisco Symphony playing John Cage. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's just a marketing tag. You're just trying to, you know, sell more tickets. Um, so, so that was, I, I would say, the big difference between curatorial concept and marketing. And we tried to really get those to be more aligned. Um, our programming director really liked the intellectual exercise of thinking about who was a renegade in his or her, her own time. Mm -hmm. And that was why some of those events uh, that felt like a, they were outliers um, were in there. But when we talked to audience members, we heard very clearly from them that they did not find that to be a legible concept. And that's why it just felt like it was something that we were trying to sell. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we changed that up a little bit and really started to narrow that definition of what renegade looks like. And now we're really kind of struggling with, or I, maybe not struggling with, but I would say the concept of renegade versus the concept of adventurousness aren't always tightly aligned. Mm -hmm. Well, like, I mean, I can speak from my own experience of having worked on the pro on this, you know, set of programs too. That to that trying to communicate a through line when you have these uh, these kinds of outliers was very difficult from sort of an engagement right. perspective too. <clears throat> Monteverdi's Vespers did not read to people as being renegade. Right. And it's, well, it's just a great <laughs> reminder that those of us who are on the inside, making this programming all the time, we develop a relationship with it, and we like the intellectual exercise right. for, an, for an audience member. Um, it can be confusing and or feel disingenuous. And, well, and I think yeah. we have to remember mm -hmm. that, you know, most audience members come once, maybe twice a year. Mm -hmm. We certainly have our subscriber base that we all love and the people who are the, the big, big, big supporters. But yeah. for most people, they're just not encountering the work that we're doing on a regular basis like that. It's much more episodic. Well, and the other thing um, that I think we learned in those conversations was that people, so people were confused by that sense of, like, really trying to, for us to decide what we thought was adventurous. Um, or renegade, um, and also just the notion that people who consider themselves to be interested in adventurous programming really, um, like, can somehow sniff out uh, mm -hmm. inauthenticity. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and you may remember that in some of those focus groups, we actually put some different design concepts in front of people, and they looked at it and said, this is really brandy. Right. <laughs> it's, it's too brand driven. It doesn't feel authentic because it feels like you're trying to make something into something that it's not. And there was there was a couple of comments about like us trying to be like your cool right. your cool That's grandma right. or like grandma's trying to look cool or your you know, like something like yeah. that was one of the comments. There was and, and and actually in the early year, because we had that juxtaposition of, you know, Beethoven with yeah. Einstein on the beach, we actually had 
for each performance, I'm remembering this now, we said, what makes it renegade? Yeah. And we described it, and people took a lot of offense to that and mm. said, don't you tell me what makes it renegade. <laughs> I'm a renegade. I can figure that out myself. Yeah. So um, it, it's really funny. And, and even today, a lot of people find that renegade, renegade tag to be really useful, and it's kind of a filter for them. Um, and some people just say, you know, don't mark it to me. I can figure this out. <laughs> we do have some questions, and I would encourage others to please join the conversation if you're interested in in uh, asking a question of Sarah. Um, one, uh, we've got somebody here asking, do you have any data about – Deborah is asking, do you have any data about moving audiences uh, with more conservative taste into the adventurous programming side? and uh, ways to keep them from being scared of trying something new. And, of course, that, I mean, that's always a question of mine in this yeah. work. If you have any hunches about, like, is it possible to make someone more adventurous, can we move them along a spectrum? Yeah, I mean, I think um, – so I don't have any I, – I sort of have data, but I haven't analyzed it yet. How's that for the answer? <laughs> so, we, we know that people – are fluid in their adventurousness from year to year. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the great thing about this segmentation engine tool is that I can slice and dice in any number of different ways. And I don't usually just look at a single season. I'll usually take two or three or four seasons. So then it starts to become a little bit more aggregated. Um, but we certainly saw that there was some movement from the averse into the curious category one year, and then the curious category down to the averse the next year. And some of it's some of it's stuff that's just out of our control. Mm -hmm. You know, the adventurous programming this year happens to all be in the spring. And if somebody is, you know, going to Florida because they're snowbirds, they might miss some of that adventurous mm -hmm. programming. Um, that's something I actually want to dig into more. But I think if we continue to think of it as a continuum, even if somebody is still in the averse category, if they're moving from a Handel's Messiah to – a program that has a, a score of, you know, 12 or 13 that still kind of falls in that averse category, but maybe starts to introduce them to something new or something different. Um, and then, of course, there's also the, the the surrounding context of what are we saying in the program notes? What opportunities are we giving people to talk mm -hmm. about the work afterwards? Um, how much of that is facilitated by us and how much of that is facilitated by them? Um, those are all really important questions to think about, too. But but the, one of the things that I love about doing the work at the boxing gym and the Schwitz is that everybody's experiencing it for the first time, and it kind of shakes all of us up as staff members mm -hmm. to remember that even in Hill Auditorium where we present 20 concerts a year, there's always somebody who is walking the threshold for the very first time, and what are we doing to make them feel comfortable and welcome? Yeah. I don't think, Deborah, that that necessarily answered your question completely, but it's something that we're, we're starting to look at now that we have five or six years' worth of data to see how people are um, moving through that pathway. And it's interesting, too, because, of course, there's this idea of trying to move – I think there's, like, two different ideas here. One is you try to move people along the spectrum, but also the other is just finding the people that are <clears throat> marketing directly to the people who are already in class. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing – I mean, frequency is so important in these conversations mm -hmm. because if somebody's coming once a year, it's really hard to assume – it's really about that second purchase. And what they're doing with the second purchase. I always, I always use the example of, you know, if I buy tickets for my uncle who's a jazz lover mm -hmm. for his birthday, um, I then get marketed every single jazz show for the next, you yeah. know, five years. And I actually am not a big fan of jazz. So, you know, we also have to recognize that sometimes people are buying or bringing people with them whom we don't even know. And so then we can't mm -hmm. even really um, rank them either. But but it's it's really something that we need to look into with frequency of purchase because a one-off mm -hmm. um, purchase, you know, if somebody only comes once, which, you know, let's face it, for all of our organizations is probably close to two-thirds of our database. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we kind of have to throw those people out of the analysis to try to figure out how to move the rest along and, and what pathways they're taking. Um, one thing, too, that I would just suggest is that, um, and, Deborah, you may be already familiar with this work, but – uh, with Dance USA's Engaging Dance Audience Project invested a lot of resources in strategies specifically related to dance. Um, and there is, a, there is an Engaging Dance Audience's cookbook on the Dance USA website, which talks about some specific strategies, um, particularly as they pertain to riskier, more contemporary or abstract work. 
Um, and I always like to give a shout out to that project because I think it's developed a lot of really interesting um, approaches to doing to doing the thing that you're you're yeah. talking about. Um, so you mentioned adapting a uh, lobby or venue to clearly brand your event. What types of changes did you make to the space? Dana asked that question. That's a great question. And it honestly, it's one of those things that is so, um, in some ways so simple that I can't believe we didn't do it earlier. <laughs> and banner stands, I mean, pull, you know, these pull-up banners are so transportable now and so easy, and you can print them for an entire season and have a strong visual identity. Mm -hmm. um, we had for the uh, the skate park place, but, but then when we did the event at the skate park, of course, that was a vast open area that we wanted to make sure had UMS branding. So we had big sales signs out on the corner and election signs, for lack of a better word, that said, you know, UMS event, this is the UMS event, park here, you know, whatever. Um, so that as people were even just driving around that street, they could see that it was an event. We then were able to bring some of those banners into the power center when we did dance and theater shows and hang them from the wall there so that immediately there was a visual identity um, to make that happen. And then, uh, you know, certainly uh, the work that you've done, Jim, in terms of the audience experience, Mm -hmm. and trying to signal to people that this is something different also yeah. has helped on that. So especially when we're in a venue where we normally or typically present, um, we've been we've been working around the notion of creating companion programming in the lobby ahead of the performance that really signals but not a talk. Um, but not a but not right. And I think it's important to say that it's not it's not about a talk, a lecture, a panel, that kind of thing. It's something that's meant to be more interactive. Right. Um, meant to be a kind of um, meant to be a kind of activity that changes the energy, mm -hmm. you know, sort of signals that something different is going to happen and kind of gets you in the spirit of what the performance might be. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we just presented um, Yuja Wang and Martin Grubinger playing um, arrangements of the Rite of Spring for piano and percussion, which is going to Carnegie Hall, and we asked um, a number of musicians from the School of Music, Theater, and Dance to essentially do. Uh, pre-show uh, set of concerts in the lobby that were all sort of unusual arrangements of the Rite of Spring for right. woodwinds, for brass, for saxo a saxophone quartet, yeah. which just kind of tune the ear and also get people thinking about what it means to um, arrange a piece of music in it for a different kind of right. instrumentation. Um, so it's not didactic, it's really experiential. Right. And, so, and there have been things that we haven't been able to do. One of our big challenges being on a university campus is that we can't ever serve alcohol. That's right. And, <laughs> and a lot of people coming to an event want to make it a full-blown experience. So yeah. post-concert reception for us can be more complicated if it's in the space. But there are other things that we've been able to do to try to own it. Yeah, our, our venues aren't typically really designed to support a, a social atmosphere. Right. And so some of these companion experiences are also really purely social, mm -hmm. um, kind of like you see with the bouncy ball. Right, right. Uh, we've got another question. Oh, yeah. Let me scroll down. Yes. From um, oh, that was a long one. Let's see. From Kristen, um, in, interested in the process of building strategy. How long did it take? How many voices were at the table? Was it driven by Wallace? Uh, guided from the inside. Um, often organizations have trouble finding space time to stop the train to really strategize and reprioritize. Would love to hear more about the beginning of the process to get moving on. This. That is such a great question, and I'm so glad you asked it, Kristen, because the first year um, we were kind of, it was a little hodgepodge in all honesty. Mm -hmm. Everybody was sort of doing their thing, but we weren't really talking as a group about where we wanted to go with it. Um, we found out pretty late in the game that we received the funding, and we had already started the process of yeah. marketing and, and promoting the season. Um, the second year of the grant, we actually created a Wallace team, and that team gets together every single month to talk through progress and to talk through how we're doing and make sure that we're on track. Um, I would say that the Wallace <coughs> Foundation and our grant manager specifically, um, you know, they, they held our feet to the fire. We had phone calls with them every four to six weeks about progress on the grant, but for us it was really getting our team together to meet once a month and really talk through everything we were trying to accomplish. Everybody had a copy of the grant proposal. Everybody had copies of the reports back and the various uh, things that Wallace was asking us to track, mm -hmm. and that really helped a lot. And I think it's something, um, I mean, we're a pretty meeting-heavy organization, but I think getting an hour of everybody's time once a month to really focus on those projects made a huge difference in our ability to move it forward. I also think that there's, it's worth saying, too, that there's a culture at UMS um, 
of when we have projects like this that we really um, desire and also require kind of representation from mm -hmm. many different departments. And, right. and it absolutely must have engagement from someone in the education and engagement area, from artistic programming, from marketing, from development. Um, and that, uh, you know, that's something I think in a way um, it, it makes uh, – the work on the project richer because I don't mm -hmm. I don't feel like we ever there's a lot more investment in the end end result it lives with mm -hmm. all of us as mm -hmm. opposed to living with a you know with one or two people um, hi Eric I think you said the renegade series isn't quite synonymous with the adventurousness of other performances how do you decide which of the adventurous performances make it into the renegade series or do not make it into the renegade series We've only had a couple of fist fights, I think. <laughs> um, no, it's it's a really it's a complicated question, and oftentimes it's been a desire. So so we sell the Renegade series as a series when we announce the season. But the truth of the matter is that people who are risk takers aren't subscribers, by and large. I mean, they're mm -hmm. just you know they're wanting to leave options open and not commit themselves to something ten months down the road. Um, so when we've when we've done Renegade as a series and looked at what gets the tag and what doesn't, it's often a matter of some of those other logistics. We want it to be representative of the whole season. So we always want on our orchestra and major classical recital a series to have a Renegade event. That's something that's been really important to our programming director, and that goes back to the earlier question about you know how do you how do you pull people along and get them to be more adventurous? Well, part of it is actually programming something that's adventurous that's going to be part of their series and um, they're going to they're going to get it whether they want it yeah. or not. Um, so a lot of it is making sure that there's that that diversity across the whole program. But then we are also looking at dates and we've had we've had a couple of occasions where we've had two big renegade events in a 7 to 10 day period and we find that people pick and choose. So we really do have to sort of um, balance that out on the calendar as well. There's also just something um, I think a little bit emerging that I maybe we learned from the No Safety Net series, which was for theater performances or theater more theater-like performances. Um, that there that that set of experience very much isolates kind of intellectual and mm -hmm. contextual risk, mm -hmm. um, whereas. Uh, Renegade traditionally, I think, more has been about aesthetic risks and yeah, I think less, that's right. less about I think um, that's right. intellectual or contextual risks. So I think that there's, there are these questions here that are surfacing about, like, do you mm – -hmm. like, how – how many of the dimensions of adventurousness kind of neatly fit into the renegade right. package? I mean, maybe ideally all of them do at some point over the season, but maybe they go into different different places. But, you know, I have to say one of the things that has made me happiest is when an audience member writes to us afterwards and says, well, you know, you just presented company Marie Chouinard, and I don't understand why that wasn't renegade. Yeah. And we said, well, it was Renegade. Yeah. We didn't call it Renegade, but, but know, it, is. It, yeah. it is, and clearly it's something that you yeah. think about that. And, and, again, Renegade is something that everybody to a certain degree defines for themselves. Mm -hmm. And and likewise, um, we've had, we had a, a writer for the local monthly magazine who said, I can't believe that UMS is calling the Kronos Quartet Renegade because they're celebrating their 40th anniversary, and how can you be 40 years old and be a <laughs> Renegade? And I'm actually looking at a almost 40-year-old renegade right oh, now. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so we have a couple of minutes left. So if there are any other uh, last-minute thoughts or reflections or questions, please shoot them up to the chat for us. Um, I know, Sarah, you've presented on this concept and this research quite a lot in the last you know, year or so. Uh, and I'd like to know just what you think the big takeaways will be for, you know, the, just for all of us. Um, and what, you know, like what you sort of hope people will walk away with and, and maybe take up in their own work. You know, it's uh, it's really hard to sustain focus because I think we often get really excited about one thread or another. Um, uh, we missed one. Did we miss one? Yes. Yeah, thank you, oh, question. Yeah. This is Johanna. She said, when thank asking you. the audience questions, how do you gather the data? Were there, was it recorded via audio, was it written down during the um, data gathering or after, and was permission needed? 
Great. Sorry about that, Stacey. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, so, um, can you go back to the question oh, yeah. I was reading sure, it sorry. as you scrolled? Sorry. It's actually a, a two-parter from Stacey. Stacey, go ahead. Um, so, I mean, when we when we um, did focus groups and, and that type of thing, we initially sent an online survey to recruit people for these groups, and they had to meet certain, um, you know, certain restrictions that we put on. One was just availability at the time, but some of it was we only sent it to people who attended certain events and qualified in a certain way. Um, and then we recorded all of the focus groups with their permission. Um, in terms, and I, if I'm not, if that's not what you're asking, Stacey, please clarify because um, uh, you know most of this was done through online surveys, mm -hmm. and and any qualitative research we always recorded everything. And um, have we gone back and listened to it? Not all 20 interviews that we did, but there are occasions where when we're looking at a at a report or, or when our researcher has been putting together information, he's he's drawn direct quotes that were particu particularly salient to this project. And when per people participate in the research, they know ahead of time right. what they're right. what they're participating in and what it's for. Right. And um and give their permission for us to, you know, aggregate the data that we collect as a part of the focus group or survey. And we've also used the intrinsic impact survey tool that Wolf Brown has for quite a number of years, which asks a lot of very specific open-ended questions, and we use that to evaluate how we're doing as well. Mm -hmm. The last question we have also from Stacey, are most of the artists brought in that are considered adventurous and renegade not American companies? Curious to know the percentage of adventurous artists that are presented that are American. It's a good question. Um, <laughs> do the quick mental math on that. We've, I'm not sure we've ever looked at that in particular. I don't know that we have. I would say it's probably 50-50. That would be my gut on it, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes it's an American company doing European work. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, I would, yeah, I would say it's about 50-50. Even in the in the No Safety Net program last year, which was really focused on kind of intellectual risk or right. conceptual risk. Um, yeah, that was there all American companies. Two American companies and two non-American companies. You're right. Yeah. You're right. So 50 50 there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that there, I, I mean, it's a great question to ask. If I were to like kind of riff on that, um, and just from my experience with Renegade, I would say that certainly for us, some of the more intellectually or topically risky presentations are definitely from American artists and mm -hmm. and um, and then the European artists that we present tend to be more um, sort of aesthetically mm -hmm. edgy although that's a, those are broad generalizations and there's lots of there's lots of overlap and exceptions mm -hmm. to those rules. They're broad generalizations. At the same time, I think you have to think when a company from Europe is, is going on tour, yeah. they need to not find enough uh, presenters to present their work to make the tour financially viable as well. And sometimes uh, that can be really challenging. Mm -hmm. So my last question as we wrap up here, what do you think, what do you hope that take, takeaways will be for this field? What do you think? Yeah, you so, I, so I think it's really easy in this field to go um, frequently from one thing to another and not pause. You're always kind of looking forward and not necessarily taking the time to reflect on what's worked and what hasn't worked. And, and that's one thing where I have to say that the Wallace framework that they put us through really requires a lot of that reflection. Sometimes the reflection feels like it happens too fast and that they want to know what success looks like the day after the event, and, and you can't really project that. But it's really forcing us to look back and consider what have we done, how have we evolved, what have, what have we changed, mm -hmm. and um, honestly, to give more credit to our audiences. Because I think sometimes we, um, just as organizations, don't really appreciate not just the decisions that they're going through and the competition that they're facing, but how much they love the work that we do mm -hmm. and how much value they get from it. Yeah. And this kind of process and, and talking to people more frequently, I mean, that for me is the biggest takeaway. Mm -hmm. Sitting down and talking to people one-on-one -on -one and not just the big donors and the people on your board and the people that you see all the time, but the people who come that you don't have those relationships with can just be incredibly valuable for really giving insight into what, what your organization is doing. And for me personally, that focus on qualitative conversations mm -hmm. is um, outrageously valuable, and I hope that we never lose that. 
Yeah, and it's it's a great point, and it's also an activity that that anyone can engage mm -hmm. in in any kind of organization of any you know budget level um, is really making time and space to sit down with audience members and have those qualitative mm -hmm. conversations. Absolutely. Hey, Sarah, thanks a lot. Thank we you, really Sarah. appreciate your presenting and letting us put you on the spot. And um, I'm handing it back over to Joanna. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, your busy season. Um, thank you to everyone who joined. Um, thank you for joining us on what I'm sure was a busy day. And um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.